Basic Brewing Radio is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, a worldwide community of fermentation enthusiasts. Join the association in September and receive a pound of free Azaka hops with your membership. That's a pound of free Azaka hops. Go to homebrewersassociation.org and use the promo code SEPTHOPS, S-E-P-T-H-O-P-S, when you join or renew. Homebrewers Association. Org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 16th, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Scott Janish, author of The New IPA and co-founder of Sapwood Cellars, is here to talk about hop oils and the impact of using them post-fermentation. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And financial supporters, this, uh, this week we'll see an early release of our video episode featuring Steve's Smoked Lavender Braggot. It's a tasty beer that Steve used some sort of sophisticated thinking and methods to put together to preserve the delicate flavor characteristics of the beverage. And he really did use a lot of the learning that uh, we've had in the past 16 years or so to put that uh, braggot together. I've also got a bonus video in the can showing my process of fermenting cherry tomatoes and uh, habaneros from the garden to make a spicy, tangy pasta sauce. So that's for all of our financial supporters coming up this month. Shout out to Mark Smith and the crew at Natural State Beer Company up in Rogers, Arkansas, whom you've heard on this show over the many years. Uh, they took home a gold for their Maybach from the Great American Beer Festival. And if I read the results correctly, uh, they were the only medal coming from Arkansas this year. Nicely done. I've told Mark that I want to get back together with them to chat again now that they've got some hardware to talk about. And they've got a bunch of batches of beer under their belt. We had them on the show in the very beginning before they opened, and they uh, they didn't have much to talk about yet, but now I'm, I'm sure they do. Susan and I had a great time over in Tulsa this past weekend at the Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational. I recorded a bunch of interviews with Oklahoma professional and home brewers there. Uh, the event was uh, well put together. It was outside with limited ticket sales, and, and the breeze was enough to keep the area well ventilated. Uh, look for a show about that coming up probably next week. Uh, the event was held in the parking lot of our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave at High Gravity and Pippin's Tap Room in Tulsa. I always love going to High Gravity. It's a, it's a true family-run operation and always well-stocked uh, with tons of different ingredients. Uh, and through their Pippin's Tap Room, which has recently expanded brewing capacity because they just can't make the beer fast enough, uh, they're able to uh, create and hone recipes that they can turn into kits for you at HighGravityBrew.com, like Stumbling Dragonfly IPA, or, trigger alert, Ichabod Pumpkin Ale. Mmm. Or if you want to use your own recipe, you can find the Build Your Own Beer page on HighGravityBrew.com, where you can choose from tons and tons of different malts, hops, yeasts, adjuncts, everything you need to make a delicious beer. And while you're on HighGravityBrew.com, you can shop for your new Warthog Electric System and use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your new Warthog gear. Check it all out at family owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Steve from Pembroke Pines, Florida writes Following your interview with Scott Janish, I brewed some cosmic debris. This is three gallons of IPA wort with first wort hopping of Warrior, then Citra and Simcoe steeped at 180 degrees Fahrenheit post-boil. Added one gallon Moscato grape must. Mmm. Pitched Omega Cosmic Punch GMO yeast and voila, accidental hazy juicy beer. Well, Steve sent me a picture and it looks, it looks delicious. 
Well, Steve, get ready for some more inspiration from Scott Janish as we talk about hop oils. Scott Janish, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thank you for having me back again so so quickly. Yeah, I told you, I emailed you. I saw your, your post on Instagram saying that you had this article posted, and I immediately emailed you, and I said, I, I feel like a stalker, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been watching you online. Do you want to talk again on the show? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. That's it's it's a new uh, topic for me to 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 actually talk about and not just write about. So this is probably a good uh, a good step for me too. And I'm sure that we'll only scratch the surface of uh, of what uh, you wrote about in your blog post on scottjanish.com and I I encourage people to go over and read the whole thing. And it's got some cool interactive, you know, kind of visual uh, graphs on there, too, that kind of uh, demonstrate uh, sort of, you know, some of the things that we're talking about. So it's worth going over there and, and checking it out. And I said that you could, you know, this could be a new chapter to uh, your book, The New IPA, a, a Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. Yeah. Uh, and it it hopefully soon uh, will be. I'm I'm working on, um, not necessarily. I toyed with the idea of because you know when you, when you write a book that's focused heavily on science, you're 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 bound to have a lot of stuff uh, be outdated as soon as it's you know you you click that publish button. <laughs> um, and so I've toyed with this idea for a while, and I think rather than trying to just constantly update uh, studies or, you know, add new material, which would just be frustrating, I think, for people that have already read it, you know, they just want the new stuff, um, or at least that's what I assume. So that I've been working on and hopefully sometime uh, in this in the next year, I can um, put out a, a smaller kind of shorter version of the book that's, um, you know, what's what's new uh, in this in this science since it was published and, you know, a couple new chapters on, on whole new concepts. Um, like like hop oils and um, hopefully talking to a bunch of other uh, cool breweries that I've I look up to and um, hopefully they'll share some more of their process and 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 recipes this time I've I've it, it was clear to me that people uh, like the science but then they want some sort of uh, some some recipes to follow so I'm gonna <laughs> do my best to see if any in any breweries will will share some with me yeah sure of course. We all like uh, recipes, at least, you know, as, as a starting point or, or an inspiration, if not, uh, you know, following them literally. Uh, right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think recipes are, are always are always good. Uh, first of all, I have to ask quickly, how are things at Sapwood Cellars? We are doing pretty good. Yeah, Mike and I are uh, just approaching um, our third year anniversary. So later this month, we'll have, uh, you know, we, we like for a little anniversary party where we have like. Three sessions of you know where people can buy tickets for a session and come in and try a bunch of special uh, barrel aged beers or, or fun variants or um, in our case this year it's kind of fun we have our first um, three year blend ready so uh, barrels of one two and three year uh, pale sour beers that were in wine barrels for uh, you know however long they <laughs> were put in there so that's that's always a fun thing when you get to that point where you have barrels of, of three different years you can choose from the blend so. Um, it's good. We're, 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 we're getting kind of hitting our stride a little bit and, um, um, hopefully people are enjoying the beers. I think Mike and I would both agree. Um, they're, they're definitely better today than they were that, that first year. I think it's just learning that bigger system and, and figuring out all the, you know, the, the differences between that and your, your small gear is a little bit of a challenge, but also we just have tried to keep learning this whole time too, and, and adjusting things. And so, Hopefully that's paid off in the finished product, but I think we can both say we're we're still having fun. I think that's the main that's the main uh, point. You you stole the words right out of my mouth. I I said I was thinking to myself my next question or my next comment was going to be by looking at your 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 social media feeds, it does look like you're having fun. Yeah, I, I mean it's it. Sometimes I have to like remind myself that right now I, instead of talking to you about beer before I go into brew beer, I would be. You know, in D.C., knocking on doors, trying to get uh, congressional staff to talk to me. And then I quickly remember how much better this this, <laughs> this gig is. So That sounds like a dream. <laughs> yeah. So you need those little reminders every once in a while, I think. 
Yeah, all it takes is a good uh, work-related anxiety dream to, you know, kind of remind you. Of <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right. I didn't share those. <laughs> we, uh, uh, we want to talk about hop oils today. And my, my question to you before we started was, what's the difference between hop extracts and oils, you know, we've heard to talk about uh, extracts for a long time now, but uh, but what's the difference between a hop extract and a hop oil, or is there? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I always, I, I, I have never really thought about it, and I've kind of used them interchangeably. I, I'm pretty sure in the in the post, but I guess you know, uh, hop oils is you know when you look at a hop, you're looking at like the total oil. Um, of that hop and, and extracts are really, you know, making an extract of those total oils. Um, but they can also be making extracts of, you know, the, the non-oil parts like the bittering parts, the alpha acids, the beta acids to, um, you know, make, make extracts of uh, more of the bittering kind, which I think is what most people um, have used, uh, you know, primarily. And I don't think a lot of people have, um, experimented with or they maybe more have uh recently because it's it's they're kind of relatively new but some of these new oils that are really aimed at um you know more of a enhanced dry hop character so instead of you know bittering in the kettle oils they're more uh, or extract they're more um you know flavor inducing oils and where and why would you use these oils yeah really i think you know my main point of even experimenting with them is, you know, does it make better beer? I think that's really what it, what it comes down to for, for us is, um, you know, there, there is some science in, you know, why you would consider these oils, but I guess really it's like, does it make your beer better? And I think in, um, some instances with some of these oils, it definitely has that, that potential. Um, you know, you're, you're really taking, you're taking an oil that is already emulsified, which means, you know, these oils are already into a liquid, which is, you know, the hard part about dry hopping is, you know, you're, you're throwing a whole bunch of hops, you know, usually pellets or, or cryo into your beer and you're, you're doing everything you can, at, you know, agitation wise, or, you know, taking advantage of different temperatures to um, increase the extraction of those oils into the beer. And I think, um, where it comes to extracts made of these oils, they're already emulsified into a liquid. And I think because of that, when you add them to a beer, um, especially post-fermentation where there's less chance of scrubbing or, you know, altering those, the, the oils that are, you know, retained in the beer, um, you have a much higher chance at, at retention of those oils. So, um, I think that potentially means, you know, higher hop flavor and, and aroma, but it's, um, you know, it's a, I wouldn't say a slippery slope, but it, it's, you know, a little bit is a little too much is way too much. And, you know, not enough. I don't think you can really tell. So it's, um, you know, it, it's one of those things that luckily you can add post-fermentation to taste, um, just really sort of scale up and, and figure out how much to use. But um, so I think, yeah, the main, the main reason to use it is um, hopefully to, to, to give an extra pop to your beer. I think, you know, as, as a home brewer for a long time. And e even as, you know, with sapwood where, you know, we're not big enough where we're selecting, uh, usually you need about 5,000 pounds of one hop in order to um, select your variety um, from a certain lot. So, you know, we're re pretty much getting whatever we you know, can get from our suppliers where, you know, the bigger you are, your advantage is really hand selecting those lots. And so I think, you know, potentially some of these oils can kind of push push the uh, flavor uh, a little bit more um, to, you know, maybe compensate for, you know, the, the hop quality that mm. you get, at least that's, you know, was kind of my hope going into it. Um, and, you know, there's other reasons too, to consider it. Um, you know, if all of these oils that I, that I discussed in the um, post are, you know, have, um, you know, there, you can use them post fermentation and you, and you don't have to worry about things like hop creep. Um, so the, you know, the enzymes that can break down sugars, um, break down dextrins that could referment, those are denatured. So it's one way to, you know, add, you know, add some of these oils post um, fermentation without worrying about, you know, your, your bottles blowing up or, mm. you know, having your kegs get way too carbonated. So, I mean, that's, that's obviously a big plus, especially for um, commercial breweries 
Um, another, uh, you know, kind of a, a positive, um, at least, you know, I, I think it's something that needs some more um, research, but I, I did dig up one paper from, I believe it was 2011, that looked at, you know, the, the, the amount of staling aldehydes that are um, in beer, um, which, you know, can cause that stale aged flavor. Um, and they found that when they, the, the uh, oil essence was in the beer from, from some of these extracts or the one that they used, um, they had less of these staling um, aldehydes in. So potentially, um, you know, they did mention that it should be studied further and because yeah, I don't know if it's more of a, if there was less of those compounds, you know, it's probably not masking it, but, you know, I don't know if it's you know, stabilizing it or, or what it's, um, what the oils are doing, but uh, potentially, and this is great for especially hazy IPAs, it could mean a little more um, shelf life or at least having your hop flavor last a little longer, which is uh, definitely something, um, you know, I, I'm interested in when you start having some of your cans go out into the wild and you don't know how long people mm -hmm. will sit on them before they, before they crack them. And, and so, where, I mean, that's a few. And, and where few they'll be them. sitting <laughs> in a hot, yes, hot garage true. somewhere. <laughs> That's true. You always think that everyone, you know, is going to keep them cold, but that's, you know, just not the case. So, um, you know, anything you can do to really increase that shelf life, I think is a, is a benefit to, you know, home brewers as well. I mean, you, you put a lot of work into those, uh, to each batch and, you know, you want that, you know, especially if you're trying to drink five gallons of something hoppy by yourself, you want it to, uh, t to la taste as good the first couple of days as, you know, the last of that keg. So, right. um, but I, I would say that that's, that's something that I hope gets looked at a little bit more. And on the home brewing side, uh, you know, well, on the on the professional side as well, you talked about yield and the fact that you know if you can use hop oils to kind of substitute for some of the uh, dry hopping, uh, you know, you get more beer uh, out of the process because you don't have to deal with you know hop debris in your process. Right, and I, that's I think that's one of the biggest selling points. Um, for commercial breweries. And, you know, that's clearly one of the things that a lot of these hop manufacturers are uh, advertising as a, as a perk. Um, but I guess, you know, in our little experience with these oils, we, we found we're still dry hopping pretty much at the same rate mm. um, and, and, and adding these in as sort of a, you know, a, an additional top note type of, uh, you know, addition rather than, you know, replacing some hops. Um, and I, you know, there's some uh, concern too, that, you know, these using oils is just not as, you know, fun is not as romantic as using the hop itself. Um, you know, it's going to replace, you know, having to use hops. And I, you know, I've used, we I did some tests where I dosed these oils into beers that weren't dry hopped at all. And, and I think it's pretty safe to say they won't completely uh, replace um, dry hopping on their own. There's still just a lot you get from the hops and the vegetal material that, um, you know, although I usually am like trying to reduce that, I think there is a certain amount you get from, from the, you know, like mouthfeel aspects and stuff from a hop that you probably can't just get from some of these oils. So um, it's, it's really, I still think it's more of a, a an addition to rather than any sort of uh, replacement. You talk in the article about, you know, since these, uh, these are, um, these compounds are soluble and they come, you know, directly from the, uh, the hops themselves, that along with the good tasting stuff, uh, you also get some of the less good tasting stuff like the vegetal or the woody or the, you know, the harsh components of the hop. And so it's not just a, you know, I'll put this same hop that I love in dry hopping. Uh, I'll use a similar, you know, amount uh, in hop oil and get a get a similar effect. Yeah, I think that was the most interesting part to me as I was experimenting with these and, and, and trying to understand some of our results by, by digging through some, some, um, in this case, uh, some studies that I had, uh, flagged for, um, the book. And, and the one that really stuck out to me was, um, a paper from, um, Thomas Shellhammer and Dean Hauser, uh, Oregon state university, um, where they, they took, um, beer that they it was dry hopped at like one pound um, per barrel which is a relatively modest a pretty small amount um and what they did is they tested um the hops themselves for you know their oil potential 
um, and the different, not just total oil, but you know, the, the makeup of those oils. Um, and then they uh, dry hop the beer and then they tested the beer itself for um, oils. And then they did a third test where they then tested the hops again to see you know, how much of the oils were still left in the spent hops. Um, and this was interesting to me because, you know, a lot of the, these, these greener, um, you know, more resinous, woody, spicy, you know, these, the compounds that fall into the, to the uh, like hydrocarbon category. So these are like, you know, myrcene, caryophylline, um, those kind of uh, compounds were almost not getting into the beer at all during the dry hop. I mean, myrcene was about, I think it was less than 1% um, was from the hops actually transferred into the beer. Um, although like linalool and draniol and some of those fruity monoterpene alcohols were, you know, closer to like 40% or a little less. Um, and to me that that's interesting because when, you know, if you consider like, you know, a, a oil that's made from a hop like citra, which is like 70% myrcene, um, that oil is already emulsified and it's, you know, it's much more readily going to, you know, be able to get into your beer. Um, especially post-fermentation where there's no CO2 scrubbing or, you know, like yeast um, pulling some out. Um, and so, you know, some of the, you know, there's no test that I found where they actually used the oil and then, um, you know, tested the beer to see how much was in there. But I would have to think it's way, way, way higher than, you know, that less than 1% that you're getting with myrcene. So, you know, if your oil is emulsified, uh, it's going to get into the solution better. And it's 70% chock full of, you know, myrcene and these green resinous compounds, which um, if you've ever smelled extract before, I don't have a better way to explain it other than extracty. <laughs> it just kind of has that extract smell because it's just really green and resinous and herbal. Uh, I, I f I'm afraid that you're just going to get, um, using these post-fermentation, you're just going to get a, you know, a re really green sort of bomb that I don't think you could even achieve um, with dry hopping alone. So I think there's, um, a little bit of, uh, skill or trickery into how to use these oils to have it more mimic an actual, um, dry hop, just because of the, the nature of, you know, how they're, how they're made to replicate, you know, the, the, the hops variety specific oil itself. And then just the, you know, the, the science of how, how these are getting into the beer and, and staying into the beer at higher rates. Um, than dry hopping alone. Our friends and sponsors at Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies now have exciting mead starter packs. Say you're, you're not familiar with delicious craft meads? Well, check out the classic mead sampler at Gronfell.com. It's got a four-pack each of Gronfell's Valkyrie's Choice, Old Wayfarer, and Nordic Farmhouse. Or be a bit more adventurous with the modern mead sampler with a four-pack each of three Havoc meads, Psychopomp, Root of All Evil, which has a ginger in it, I believe, and is del delicious, and Hop Swarm, which is a dry-hopped mead. Each starter pack comes with a free mead guide and cocktail recipe card and free shipping across the country. That's right, free shipping across the country. You'll also find some fun mystery swag tossed in there, too. Ricky and Kelly want you to step into the delicious world of craft mead like so many other certified mediacs who are already on board. Check all, all the tasty honey-based deliciousness at groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Yeah, it was amazing uh, how inefficient dry hopping is at, <laughs> at pulling these yeah. compounds out. Uh, but you know, it's it's kind of an unbalanced as the as the way they come out. So maybe you know, in the natural way of just dry hopping the beer, you know, uh, brewers over time have just discovered that you get more pleasant uh, compounds or more pleasant flavors by doing it that way. Um, you talk about, I mean, the, you, uh, t you spend your, the article is about uh, post-fermentation, uh, but, you know, I'm assuming that you can use these oils in, in the hot side as well. And, uh, you know, that you didn't cover it in the article, but, you know, that would, would change, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, some of the characteristics. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you could 
definitely use some of these oils um, hot side. And, and I think that would be great in addition to, um, you know, whirlpool hopping, just because, you know, you're really increasing your chances of getting those, those hop oils into your, into your fermenter, which is, you know, what you would want for just that saturated hop character as well as just some, you know, yeast interaction with some of those um, compounds. And, you know, the heat itself, I think would you know, remove some of those, those hydrocarbons um, and whatever is left would, you know, also probably be additionally removed by active fermentation. Um, the only thing you would have to take in consideration is um, some of these oils do contain alpha acids and some of them do not. Hmm. So the ones that do, obviously, if you're using those hot side um, organized samurais, which would give you more bitterness, which you could, you know, account for by reducing your um, bittering charge or your, your whirlpool temperature. Um, but I think more interesting, some of these um, don't contain alpha acid. So, you know, I talked to, there's a company called Glacier Hop, uh, Hops Ranch who has a, a hop soil um, brand or line of, of oils. And, you know, I threw some uh, email exchange with them and, and looking at some of their videos uh, explaining their um, hop oils, they, they said that they don't contain um, alpha acids, but they are, you know, pretty true to the hop itself. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's, you could, you know, use your, your big whirlpool addition like normal, which, you know, five to eight ounces or whatever per uh, five gallons or 19 liters. Um, and then add some of the, the oil too, um, during the whirlpool just to increase those oils even more. And then I think that would even benefit fit by you know, removing some of those greener compounds and hopefully those more polar um, monoterpene alcohols will you know um, just retain, be retained at higher amounts to um, you know I guess increase that that hop flavor that you kind of need to balance the you know heavy dry hopping and then the effect of uh, fermentation you mentioned as well um, you know might change the uh, characteristics even more Right. I think, and, and you could also consider, you know, adding some of these oils uh, mid fermentation two, three days in um, as well to, to kind of alter that um, those characters to, uh, and, and this is kind of, you know, all just my opinion is just to bring those back to you know, a more realistic um, dry hop mm. uh, aroma and flavor. Um, but I guess it, I, uh, there is another company um, that we worked with. We actually brewed a beer with them at the brewery called Totally Natural Solutions, where they they're taking um, they it, during their process they have a pr proprietary process where they can fractionalize these oils, um, which was very interesting to me because they're taking um, so let's just stay with Citra, which is you know again really high in in myrcene. Um, and s some of these hydrocarbons, they can fractionalize out these different oils. So they can, you know, look separately at the, you know, myrcene and um, caryophylline and the, you know, fruitier mono, like linalool and geraniol. They can, they can almost, they can fraction those off so they can reduce those greener amounts hmm. um, while leaving the, um, the fruitier compounds that I, I think we want in higher, um, higher amounts into the beer. Um, so they have like a hop shot and a hot burst line of oils of, again, um, variety specific, which is great. They're not, you know, they're not made up of blends of different oils or, or taking an oil like, you know, Cascade and, and trying to fractionalize that to look more like um, Citra. They're, they're not doing that, which is nice. It's uh, my understanding is coming directly from those um, hop varieties. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's great because, you know, the hop, their hop shot line is actually supposed to resemble more of a um, a whirlpool addition because they're removing some of those um, hydrocarbons that would be removed obviously through a whirlpool from the heat um, but i think it 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 almost seems like a better option to use their whirlpool addition as a dry hop addition because then you're um, you know a, a post fermentation addition just because you're probably having that's more of a realistic dry hop addition as well so mm -hmm. um I'm, i, I kind of like the uh their hop shot line and a few that we've used um just dosing you know bench top dosing gave it a nice like bright um character sort of uh, helps the beer pop a little bit without um, the hop burst which can take which isn't fractionalized um has a bunch more of the the near scene and those kind of compounds um 
a little bit too much um, in my impression started to raise the the bitterness it kind of made it you know e- even though it's not really adding any um, actual bitterness it just added that perceived bitterness probably just from a little more of that astringency that it could be adding um, especially when you got a little bit too high so um, that's that's the great part with all these hops or hop oils is you know you can do this all from from a glass post fermentation with you know a little dropper and um, really get a sense of them without you know, wasting our a whole batch or um, <laughs> you, you can always you know jump it into another keg with the amount that you scale up to for example so uh, there there's still a lot of trial and error to to go into this but that's kind of a where I where I'm looking at them from now anyways. So is there, I mean, you can dose a, a single glass, but is there a challenge <clears throat> with uh, with getting these to be soluble or mixed in uh, to a larger batch of beer, a keg, or even a tank? You know, what are the challenges uh, with these, and, and are they the same in, in the way that you approach it? Yeah, I think the, um, so most of these are coming pre-emulsified, and I think this is where a lot of brewers will have a, a little bit of a, uh, a, a hiccup with them is they're most of the time they are coming emulsified in, in glycol. Um, so it's a food grade glycol, um, which clearly doesn't sound like something you want to consume too much of. Right. Hmm. Um, it's usually about a hundred, hundred times the amount of oil in glycol. So, um, you know, I, when you really scale it up, it's, it's a relatively small amount in a, in a batch of beer, but that, you know, could be a concern. But I mean, there's other ways too. You can use ethanol, um, you know, to to try to um, emulsify these too before you add them. But you know, most of these are already coming pre-emulsified, and you know, some of them have options to get them not emulsified. But that just means you really have to do something to, you know, get them into a solution. Otherwise, they're just going to stick to the walls of your your keg or your your fermenter, or you know, just probably just drop to the bottom or or what have you. So um, you, really mixing them in is, is kind of key. And what's the effect on different beer styles? I mean, is, you know, a, a, a light lager the same as a, uh, as a New England IPA as far as how these are used or the effect on the beers? You know, I, we, we did take one of our lagers that wasn't um, dry hopped and I just put them in some of our um, five gallon homebrew kegs with, with some of these oils um, and I just, you know, and it clearly could just be, you know, the particular oil that we used in variety for, for that uh, little experiment. But um, I really liked them more in a beer that was already dry hopped. Just they kind of felt like they belonged and it was more of a, a natural uh, thing where it, it kind of weaved in better and, and in, a, in a good way when you hit the right amount. Where as in the, the lager where there's, you know, obviously not a, a lot to to hide behind and they're, you know, the extract kind of stuck out a little bit, um, in a more of an artificial way, um, to my palate. Um, and interesting, like I can get like this top of my mouth, like oily slickness sometimes with, with some of these two, um, which is, you know, I I don't know if it's like a tell that, you know, that, that it's in there, but I, maybe that's just an amount thing too. Um, but that was that was something I noticed more when I was doing it in the lager than when I had it in a, a beer that was already um, pretty heavily dry hopped. But again, that's one one try with one lager, and so I'm sure there's um, other methods. You know, maybe in a lager where we add it um, in the whirlpool or during active fermentation, it might um, kind of blend in better and create a you know a lager with more you know saturated hop flavor. That's something we um, we haven't tried so. It's fall, and it's time to start thinking about making ciders. The next seasonal strain from Imperial Organic Yeast has you covered. A40GF Bubbles is a traditional cider strain. Bubbles is a beautiful strain for fruit juice-based fermentations. The clean profile of the yeast, especially when it's used at the lower end of the temperature range, allows the nuances of the uh, fruit to be prominent in the finished bubbly beverage. I'm getting thirsty just thinking about it. This strain is produced on 100% gluten-free media. Imperial doesn't recommend the strain and the use of uh, wort-based fermentations, but 
When you see apples or even pears available this fall, think of Imperial A40 GF bubbles. You know we love Imperial with those 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open package. My stir plate is dusty because I don't make starters anymore for moderate gravity 5-gallon batches. And my airlock is usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew store about Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. And and what's the effect on mouthfeel? I mean, these are oils. I mean, do you get any kind of, I guess you'd have to add a bunch to get a significant kind of oily character. Yeah, I mean, the, the there is a, a, a paper that was um, released a few years ago, and actually I reached out to the um, author of that paper um, when I was putting this together, and she sent me a, uh, her name is Christina Dia, uh, Christina, oh, her last name is escaping me right now. Um, but she sent me a paper that she just like had published like that week is my understanding, um, basically updating what they just looked at. And it was so timely because they were looking at things like the mouthfeel impact of, um, of using hot boils like this, but they were, they were looking at the different fractions. So, you know, looking at the sesquiterpenes or, you know, the monoterpene alcohols and even breaking some of those out like linalool and geraniol um, ind- independently. And they would have, so they would like dose a beer with just that fraction and have a, a trained panel um, taste it. Um, and it was, it was interesting to me because it does sort of in a way um, not verify, but kind of explain my um, experience with them in that, you know, some of the, 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 mon- uh, the hydrocarbons that they, when they would dose the sesquiterpene fraction into a glass, um, it had a, it scored much higher in, in like a harsh bitterness. Hmm. Um, when a, a lingering bit, bitterness, it, it was also, you know, higher. Whereas like the linalool and, and draniol um, were, were much smaller in that, in that area. Um, on the flip side, like the smooth bitterness um, impact from draniol and monoter- other monoterpene alcohol. Uh, rate rated the highest where of course the opposite would be the sesquiterpene fraction uh, um, so again that's kind of that goes back to what we were talking about earlier and it's just that those high amounts of those emulsified compounds like that um, that otherwise would get removed from a beer could have you know mouthfeel impacts like that um, and in terms of like what those compounds smell like which is also you know very important in IPAs, those sesquiterpene fractions were, you know, you know, earthier, mustier, more resinous, whereas these um, monoterpene alcohols were higher in, you know, specific um, descriptors like pear, um, orange fruits, grapefruits, um, lemon. And so it's, you know, I think that's more what people are after in, in um, you know, IPAs is that you know, less of that green and, and, and musty and earthy thing and more of that you know, bright fruit character where so i think that's where using those fractionalized oils or you know trying to use those during active fermentation or in the kettle could um be you know potentially they have a be a nice addition to an ipa mm-hmm. now talk a little bit more about your practical uh uses uh, you you had products from a few of these companies so talk about the range of things that that y'all did uh with these oils yeah, so we pretty much used them all um, post fermentation um, for the most part. We did we did, did use one, and then we um, this is pretty much uh, last week where we used um, Barth Haas has a new um, a new one called Spectrum, um, which I believe is just you know it's the whole spectrum of the the hop oil, and this you know includes it's one of the only ones that's made entirely with with. Um, hops. So there's, this doesn't even contain um, an emulsifier. I believe it's hmm. um, just contains um, water, I think 30% water. Um, and it doesn't contain iso alpha acids or um, humulones, which can give you a, a bitterness perception, especially when you dry hop. Um, and so because it contained polyphenols and it was the whole hop, um, we decided to add that one during active fermentation about, you know, towards the tail end of a, of a ferment. Um, and so we, you know, we didn't do a, 
a huge, a huge amount in there, but I think it was about um, one and a half milliliters of oil per hectoliter. So I'd have to do the math on that to see what that is in a homebrew batch, but a pretty modest amount. Um, and I, you know, it's, I like that it was slightly noticeable, but didn't have a huge impact. And I think that's kind of where I'd like to be on these early tests with these is, you know, try to have it be a, an additive without, um, you know, over completely overtaking a, um, you know, 20 barrel <laughs> batch of beer. So, <laughs> um, but so, but most of ours has been, um, you know, post fermentation, um, just to get a good sense of the, the oils and, and which amounts to use. And we pretty much, uh, you know, across most of these, I think a good starting place is like 10 to 20 um, milliliters per um, hectoliter, which is, um, you know, that's kind of the language a lot of these um, companies use in terms of their dosing rates. I think for a home brewer, that would be about 0.5 to 0.75 grams per gallon, mm. I believe. So it's a pretty small amount. Um but again, you can you can kind of dose these into a glass and and see um, for yourself. Um, I think that rate would go up. So if you're going to be adding adding that during active fermentation, I think you could probably um, in, uh, you know enhance that amount a little bit. But that's kind of where we've tried it so far is just that um, little last punch to uh, to an IPA. Yeah, it sounds like. Uh, this is not a cure all. This is not a <laughs> something that's that's going to take the place of using you know hop pellets or hop cones uh, in the process. But it, at least at the current state of the technology, it's more kind of as something in the spice cabinet, sort of you know to use a cook, cooking analogy, something just to kind of uh, give an extra sort of level or a, a, an extra note of uh, yeah. hop character. I think it's kind of like, you know, when we were talking about the genetically engineered yeast strains and, you know, we, we said that it's kind of, you know, it's not a, a huge game changer. It's just another, you know, tool that you can, you can use to try to increase some of your beers. You know, let's say you do a, an IPA and you just, you're, you were pumped, you did everything right. And maybe the, the hops you use just weren't, you know maybe a little older than you thought or, or whatever the case. And it didn't, you know, pop as much, you know, if you have those oils on hand, you could, you know, try dosing them into a glass and if it makes the beer better, you can, you know, add it to your, your keg. Um, you know, so it's more of, you know, exactly like another uh, spice in the cabinet or another tool in your toolkit to, uh, um, you know, alter a beer, just kind of like, you know, things like maltodextrin or, you know, things that add a little more sweetness to a beer or, you know, it's, they're not, you know, we, we're definitely not using these in every single beer we, we, we brew right now. It's kind of a, still trying to figure out um, their place and, and maybe only in, in certain um, situations kind of on the fly, would you need them? But um, so it's, we did a, um, you know, some of the beers we did plan for them to, to be included. And um, we uh, did a beer with uh, other half brewing that just opened up a facility in, in DC um, and we actually had like a custom oil made for that one to purposely take a Simcoe oil and reduce a lot of those greener compounds um, and added that um, post fermentation. And that, that turned out great. So I think there's, you know, if you can kind of uh, plan for it to be used, um, but I think you'd have to you know, do some small trials to really know, you know, how to do it um, beforehand before you know, scaling up big like that. Yeah, I think the ability to to customize the combinations of the compounds uh, to me that that seems the most practical uh, approach to it. I mean, you're not just throwing everything into the into the serving vessel or into the kettle or wherever you're putting it. You're actually being able to pick from kind of a menu of compounds of, of the the kind of characteristics that you want. Yeah, I think I know that that's a way to look at it. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, if you're dry hopping during mid fermentation, um, you know, a lot of times that's thought of as the, the biotransformation addition, I think of it more as a way to alter that, that hop that you're adding, because that active fermentation is, you know, of course, scrubbing some of those compounds that you're extracting into the beer. So in a way, you're, you're you kind of do that 
um, with mid fermentation dry hopping is you're taking a hop and you're, you're kind of altering the end result um, by allowing some of these compounds that um, some may be, you know, removed anyways, because they're, um, they're so volatile, but you know, other ones might be retained otherwise if you did a post fermentation in higher amounts and by adding it mid firm, you're kind of, you know, pushing some of those off, taking a, potentially taking a hop, you know, more in a, a fruity direction and less in the you know, resinous um, herbal direction. So, you know, that's kind of something I think some brewers are doing anyways with um, actual hops. And, and in this case, it would just be with the oil, which is, you know, just kind of an amplified version of it. You've got some really cool interactive charts uh, on the blog post uh, with different uh, sensory ca- characteristics uh, that you can click on. And then, you know, for those those out there like me who, you know, uh, when you start when I start reading the names of these compounds, I can't remember what <laughs> which one is which, you know. But if you click on a certain characteristic uh, on these charts, uh, the, the little compound, they're little blocks of compounds that uh, arrange themselves and some are bigger than others. And so it's like, you know, you get kind of an idea of the, you know, which ones of these compounds uh, contribute to those uh, sensory elements. And so, you know, it's kind of like I say, for, for somebody like me who, you know, uh, my eyes kind of glaze over when I read the <laughs> read the compound yeah. names because I can't remember. <laughs> I know. <laughs> having I little the same. <laughs> having little blocks of different colors, you know. Oh, I can I can kind of get that. <laughs> so that that was cool. I thought. Yeah, that, I started doing that more because when I'm you know reading some of these studies, they have. Um, you know, they have their own charts or, or they'll explain stuff in more of a, a word um, data kind of, you know, a paragraph type thing. But the, the data is there. Um, so if you can you know, take that and, and kind of input it into a, you know, a chart situation that helps you know me see it better in, in a more um, an obvious way, I guess you could say. And then, of course, you know, I send I send that chart to the, the author just to be like this this looks right to you, right? That I, I understood your results correctly, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, it's, I think it's always helpful to, you know, there's a, another chart on there that I had um, made for the book, which it really just kind of breaks down the different classes, the, the you know, the, the three different classes of hop oils too, which is a good reference. So if you kind of see which ones are doing which in terms of flavor, you can kind of jump back up and say, oh, that's part of the, that's part of the hydrocarbons or, you know, that's the amount of terpene alcohol. Um, so hopefully that's, that's helpful too. And the more we all kind of talk about individual compounds, hopefully it starts to stick a little better for us. Well, it's a fascinating article uh, and I appreciate your, your putting it out there and, you know, it's just another example of, you know, somebody who was a home brewer and now a professional brewer and also also an author. And you're sharing, you know, the results of your experience and your experiments out there with the rest of the world. You know, so it's part of this feedback loop that uh, you're discovering things, you're putting things out there. Other people t- are taking that information, hopefully doing other experiments and sharing the information. And so we all get better beer as a result of it. I hope so. I, I definitely hope so. And I think it's, um, you know, if I, if I keep bugging other brewers or, you know, other, you know, labs making things it, um, for, for them to be transparent, I think it's only fair if, if I am to start with. So hopefully that, that helps people uh, continue to, 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 to share their results. Um, and one of the fun things about doing this too, is you get, you know, comments or emails from other breweries that have tried stuff that, you know, completely changes your, your mindset on, on certain things or gets you experimenting in, in different ways. So um, I think Mike and I have always kind of had that um, mindset of, you know, putting out all of your results, good and bad, and um, hopefully people learn from it. But then also you get people uh, that, that are ahead of you and have already tried certain things and can save us um, some, some bad beer in the future. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's the great circle of beer. Right. <laughs> right. Circle. <laughs> Cue the music. Uh, <laughs> all right, Scott. Well, I this has been fun to get together again, and uh, I look forward to the next time that I can stalk you and then get uh, good information. 
<laughs> I don't think that's technically stalking, but uh, <laughs> I, pre- I appreciate you uh, keeping up on it and, and having me uh, having me back on. It's fun to uh, it's a challenge for me to to try to verbally uh, you know talk about some of the stuff I write about. So it's it's a good like I said at the start. It's a good. Uh, process for me to go through. (laughs) Well, I'm glad I could help. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Well, thanks again to Scott. You can find that article on scottjanish.com and be sure to pick up a copy of the new IPA, A Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. And if you're in the D.C. area, of course, drop by Sapwood Cellars and tell Scott and the mad fermentationist Mike Tonsmeyer hello for us. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to see how to write to jamesbasicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from, check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.